Hey, what's going on, guys? I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World and the Black Business School. And I want to say hi to everybody who's on the line, uh, everybody from the Black Financial Channel. Um, if you want to know, if you're watching the video later, uh, they are watching live from theblackfinancialchannel.com. That's where you get daily financial analysis, uh, kind of like a black version of CNBC. Uh, so make sure you hit the thumbs up button, share button, and subscribe button. Also, hello to everybody on Instagram. Uh, our Instagram page is The Real Boyce Watkins. And uh, just so you guys know, on Instagram, I have uh, posted out a question for you guys. I showed a picture of Antonio Brown from Sports Illustrated, uh, and it, it, the, the image looks a little dark to me. It looks like they kind of did an O.J. Simpson effect <laughs> on that image. And I'd be curious to uh, get you guys' take on uh, what you think about that. And I'm going to discuss this later on at DrBoysTV.com. Uh, I see Felicia in here. Felicia's my grandmother's name, so I already love you. From Ohio, uh, I see Bryce and Tamara and Brittany and Teddy. How you doing? Everybody shout out your city. Hit the thumbs up button and uh, let's get it started. Let's uh, start the intelligent conversation now. Uh, today, I have the honor and the privilege of uh, speaking with uh, somebody that I consider to be uh, a respected uh, older sister, a respected colleague, uh, a mentor, a buddy, uh, just an, a brilliant uh, intellectual. Uh, and in fact, we're two for two with MIT PhDs because he just yesterday on Dr. Boyce TV, we had Dr. Randall Pinkett, who got a computer, a PhD in computer science from MIT. Well, today we have Dr. Julianne Malvo, who has a PhD uh, in economics from MIT. And in case y'all don't know, this is a real PhD. This ain't one of those fake PhDs you see out here. <laughs> this is, you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Malvo. Well, I, I, earned, I earned this sucker. Nobody gave it to me. It's not honorific. It's real. And you got the battle scars to prove it. And so we're, we're actually, we should actually cheer. Everybody, I want you to give a, a, a digital round of applause for Dr. Malvo. Clap it up, clap it up for the system. Hey. Because, because a PhD, a PhD in economics is very difficult to obtain. A PhD from MIT is very difficult to obtain. And a PhD in economics from MIT is very difficult to obtain. Uh, and so I want you guys to just understand like that you're in the presence of, of intellectual royalty. And I hope that when we see black folks uh, doing great things that, that don't necessarily involve dribbling basketballs, throwing footballs, or busting a <laughs> right? no, no disrespect to the entertainers. We know that that's its own type of brilliance, but we got to cheer for our in intellectuals. We must do this because the intellectuals are the ones who can guide us out of these storms that we're dealing with in America. So, uh, Dr. Malvo, um, first of all, I'd like to ask, how are you doing today? I'm great. You know, it's a wonderful day. It's beautiful here in Washington, D.C., you know, one of your team members got on my nerves a little earlier, but, you know, that's life. Uh, <laughs> well, but other than that, it's all good. You know, coming off of a very busy Congressional Black Caucus week where I pretty much bookended it. I was on the opening town hall on Thursday with Dr. Cole and uh, Dr. Jeanette Cole, voice, um, um, Mark Morial, Derek uh, Johnson from the NAA, wonderful sister uh, Jennifer McClellan from Virginia, and the new head of the AMA, Dr. Patrice uh, Harris. So we had a very uh, resounding opening. And I was blessed to be asked to, they didn't have a keynote speaker this year. They had a spark session. I never heard of that before. Y'all young people have to educate me on that. But it was like a 10 minute interview. And one of the anchors interviewed me. Uh, so I opened and closed. So that was like really cool uh, to, <laughs> to have that opportunity. And I talked of course about the economics of enslavement 
and about reparations, you know, the stuff that I'm passionate about. Well, you know, I, I, I'm glad these conversations are being are being had. Um, and by the way, I meant to ask you, did you see the trailer for uh, the movie Harriet? By chance? I did not. I have not seen that. I've heard about it. I haven't seen it. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really it's really nice. I mean, it's really, you know, powerful and makes you want to see it. You know, when I saw the trailer, I said, OK, I think this is going to be a movie that everybody's going to go see. And uh, I mean, who can argue with with, uh, you know, a Harriet Tubman film that's done right and seems to um, show tremendous respect for uh, all that she accomplished? I, I'll tell you, I, I feel like they were going for the, jang the you know, the female Django kind of feel. You know, like, like you know, don't, don't take no shit. I'll shoot, shoot a white well, man. Well, she was right something else, though. She she was totally something else. Uh, her There's a historic landmark up in um, Maryland, where she's from. It's about two hours from here, hour and a half from here. And a good bud of mine and I have been there a couple of times just to check it out. And, you know, we keep threatening to do the walk. I mean, there's a walk where she went from Maryland up to Pennsylvania to lead people to freedom. And so we keep threatening to do it, but we lazy. We probably not gonna do that, you know, 120 mile walk. <laughs> if the whole truth is to be told. But um, the the she was just something else in terms of her, ter her tenacity, her unwillingness to accept enslavement. She even cut her boo loose with the brother. She hooked him up and had clothes for him and everything for him to escape. He wouldn't do it. She's like, okay, next, you know. So um, she was she was very focused and. The numbers are murky about how many people she led to freedom, but it's clear she led a lot of her family members, a lot of other people, you know, probably hundreds of people out of enslavement and freedom. Even though she could have been re-enslaved going back to Maryland, it didn't matter to her. She kept going back to get people out. Well, you know, I mean, isn't that what this is all about? You know, the struggle, isn't that what the struggle is supposed to be about, you know? Um, you know, not just freeing yourself, but really going back into freeing as many others as you can. Um, in fact, actually, you know, on, um, on our platform, one of the things that we decided amongst us was that there should be a new measure, a new standard for what we consider to be successful Black people. You know, a, a, a successful Black person uh, should not just be a person that is on TV and making lots of money or, whoa, look, so-and-so is a billionaire now. I think success should be measured by, you know, what are you doing for the masses? You know, not what did you do for a couple of people? Like, because there's always going to be tokenism. But what did you do? Can, can you point to a place where you've employed two or 300 people? If you're, if you're a billionaire, you should be able to create 500 jobs, 1,000 jobs easily, right? You know, or, or did you build a school? Are you educating hundreds or thousands of children? You know, like, what are you doing that's connected to the masses? What are you doing to go back and really liberate the masses other than a couple of symbolic things? Like, I, I gave away three turkeys at, at Christmas time. <laughs> you know, because that's what happens. You get the little, the little polite charity, the bullshit charity, but you're not getting sort of the, the, the real heavy lifting that's necessary uh, to really- That's a, such a good out. point. I mean, I wrote a column last week. Now I wrote a column last week called, Please Bring School Supplies. It was really speaking to the number of events that I went to at the end of August, early September, where people were asking, bring school supplies. And I'm saying, why do we need to bring school supplies? Why aren't our schools properly funded? Why are you doing this kind of, I mean, it's a good gesture and all that. And people go and you buy 20 bucks worth of crap and bring it, you know, notebooks and pens and all that. But we shouldn't be funding our schools that way. And we have enough wealth in our community to be doing a lot better. Well, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, well, I'll tell you what, I, I believe, um, you know, what we believe in the Black Business School is what we call the Black Core of Three. We believe Black people should be uh, doing all we can to educate our own children. Uh, create our own jobs and support black businesses. Uh, and the reason that uh, we believe this is because we believe that a lot of the, uh, you know, the public education, unfortunately, uh, it, it leaves so many loopholes in terms of what black children need to know. Like, like, for example, it's criminal that they don't all know everything there is to know about Marcus Garvey, right? They, they shouldn't. Uh, don't they, get me started, know. boys. Don't get me started. You know, I've been talking about lynching because I'm working on this book on black money. It's not done yet. It's in the embryonic stages, but I'm working on this book. But here's the deal. As I've talked to people about lynching, I've had young black people as well, young white people, but young black people, oh, that didn't happen. Really? You're exaggerating. No, almost 5,000 people were lynched. And the lynchings were not about sex, as many people will tell you, black man touched a white woman. Most of them were about economics, They're about economic envy, about black people having the nerve to start their own businesses, to negotiate their own prices, 
to own an automobile. And all these were things that got you lynched. To have land. A brother in uh, Florida, the Grove area of Florida, had 40 acres. Well, you know they lynched him for that. Because he had, but actually they didn't lynch him. They lynched his two sons and they incarcerated him. Because he had too much land. He had orange groves, which meant he, get, he had power to negotiate prices. Or the 200 people that were lynched in Arkansas because they tried to start a far, farmer's cooperative. So we don't know our history. And because we don't know our history, we, we sort of are mired down in the swamp of ignorance, which does not allow us to own ourselves, to really talk about the temerity, the nerve. You, you, it takes nerve. We talk about Harry. It takes nerve to say, uh-uh, white folks, we ain't having this. Mm. And there mm. were people who did that, and many were lynched for it. Wow. Well, did, did y'all catch that? I mean, you know, give me a yes or no if, you, if you're internalizing this. If you guys, you know, in the chat, I want you to make sure, I mean, we can't gloss over these stories. Each of these stories, what's, what's, what's so painful about hearing these stories, Dr. Malvo, is that each story is very deep, very painful person. I mean, if, if any of these stories happened to any of us in our own families, we would be traumatized for life. It would be intergenerational trauma, right? And, but because there are so many stories, we get into this thing where, remember Joseph Stalin said that one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic, right? It's, it's sort of like you're overwhelmed by so much uh, you know, trauma and pain that you just sort of gloss over it. Like, oh yeah, five more people died over here and then three more families were murdered over there, right? And, and you just sort of, but I want you guys to really, you know, I think you almost have to meditate on it and sort of imagine like just that first story you said, a successful man had orange groves and first they murdered, they lynched his sons. So first you've lost both of your children and then they incarcerate you for life. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that for those of us who really want to understand this, I think we almost, you know, similar to what the Jewish community does, we have to stop for a minute and really swim in that pain for a moment so we can really connect to it. Because we don't, we don't connect to it. I, I think that we just talk about it like, oh yeah, it happened, it was bad and now it's over. You know, write us a couple, you know. Well, give, see, that's what white people would like us to forget about it. But it is, it's a community trauma. It's not an individual trauma because basically what we learn from lynching, Ida B. Wells said, lynching is an act of white supremacy. What we learn from lynching is how not to be the tall nail, how not to get out there, not to put yourself out there. And I could tell you personal stories of the trauma that the specter of lynching has caused to elders in my family. As an example, I, was, I took my mom in 1986 to, uh, Biloxi, Biloxi, Mississippi. She grew up there. She went to some school, our mother of sorrows. It was a school that the nuns had for Negroes and Indians. And so the school was closing. It had been open for over a hundred years. It was closing. She wanted to go to the closing. We rented a car in uh, New Orleans. We flew into New Orleans, rented a car and we get in the car. Mommy says to me, now Julianne, if we get stopped by a white person, I want you to be polite. <laughs> That's how she starts out. Um, well, cause she knows me. And sure enough, we're about, we've crossed um, from Louisiana to Mississippi, sure enough. And I'm very careful to be at the speed limit or below. You know, I'm like, I don't want to get stopped. I want no drama. I get stopped. Give the man a rid of car papers, give him my license. He's getting real familiar and smart ass with me. Excuse my language. Mom starts crying. I'm like, mommy, why are you crying? Just give the man whatever he wants. I told, I said, dude, look, Give me a ticket or a respite. Do whatever the F you're going to do because I'm not fooling with you today. My mom now is sobbing. She's, she's totally frightened. She thinks something's going to happen. And so he goes around and he's all respectful. Her man, why are you crying? Just don't bother my daughter. She has a smart mouth. Just don't bother her. I'm like, I don't, mommy, I have not been smart mouth. I asked the man if I broke a law. He claims I was speeding. You see the speedometer because you've been looking at it. I've been going 55, 55, 54, 53. She literally sobbed for he finally he could maybe get out of the car. She's crying even more. Get out of the car. And he tells me I should pay attention to my mother. She's obviously a good gal. I said, my mother's not a gal. I said, she's a grown woman. And he said, you need to watch you in. I said, well, if you go take me in, take me in. I'm like, you know, take me in. My mom is sobbing up a river. So he said, only because of your mother, I'm not taking you in, but you better watch yourself, gal. 
I said, that would be called Dr. Belvo. Um, mommy, is, she is like beside herself. And she fussed at me from, for 60 miles. Why right? You didn't have to go there. You didn't have to say that. Blah, 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 blah. White people don't. Well, she, we had some lynchings in our family. Mm. We've had some issues. And she, she, she just can't take it. She can't stand it. You know? And that's what lynching did is it made a whole generation of people frightened, scared. And so they would defer. She would be the one who would get off the sidewalk if a white person was coming because she wouldn't have to pay the consequences, you know? Wow. And this is not like her, my mother. It's the generations of people. There's a book by Angel Slim Sims called Lynching where people literally were the same county of lynching, but they have been so um, brainwashed and doc they don't talk about it. They'll say stuff like, I don't remember that happening. She would bring it up, say, look, this happened when you were 10 years old. And they said, I don't remember. I don't know anything about it because they don't want to know anything about it because it's scary. And so that fear to me, boys, is partially a cause of economic suppression. So people were not prepared to do what it, the entrepreneurial spirit was dampened by lynching. I mean, Tommy Moss, we talked about this before, Tommy Moss, who started a store, the People's Grocery in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, across the street from a white man's store. Because the white man's store was dirty, had alcohol, he had 10 citations for alcohol, had gambling, had prostitution. So black people didn't want to go there, but it was the only store. So he said, let's start our own. Mm, wow. White man wasn't having that. Two little boys got into a fight over marbles. You hear over marbles. The white boy runs to the white man's store and says, the black boy took my marbles. Three white men with shotguns go to shoot up the black man's store over some marbles. The brothers weren't having it. They had guns too. They were like, y'all get up out of here. The next thing you know, Tommy Moss and his two friends were arrested. Two days later, they were lynched. That was the first lynching that Ida B. Wells looked into. This had nothing to do with sex. This was economic envy, economic envy, economic envy. Whenever we stood up for ourselves from an economic perspective, we were stomped down by lynching because Jim Crow laws and other laws allowed that to happen because laws were never enforced. Mm. You get, this is what the, I get excited about this, so forgive me. I'm no, not excited. No, no, just, no, no, really nothing, nothing to forgive. Nothing to forgive. You know, and it, that's, um, uh, everybody, please, in the chat, please tell Dr. Malvo that, that this is what we want to hear. Like, let her, get, you know, encourage it, 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 because I think, because the thing is, the reason that we like hearing from, from yourself and, and those who are in the know on things like this is because this is stuff that is not taught in school. I don't know. Did anybody else? Did anybody else learn this in school? Let, let us know. Yes or no? If you learned this in school or not? They didn't I, teach it in school, right? If you taught, if people taught the true American history, there'll be a whole lot of mad black folks and white folks. Wife, a lot of people just don't believe it. They're like, this could not have happened. Yes, it happened. Yes, it happened in this country. When well, we're running around the world talking about democracy, we're lynching black men in uniform. Mm. Wow. Well, by the way, everybody, in case you just came in, I'm speaking with Dr. Julianne Malveaux. Uh, she has a PhD in economics from MIT. She's also a noted uh, commentator, uh, uh, thinker, political scientist, and just many, many things that she does incredibly well. Uh, her books, uh, if you want to know the titles of her books, uh, the, the first book I actually read was uh, Sex, Lies, and Stereotypes. Is that right? Did I get it right? That's right. Perspectives of a Bad Economist. Yeah, Perspectives of a Bad Economist. <laughs> now, that's funny. Uh, I read that book a long time ago in grad school, and, and Dr. Malvo was actually the first the first public scholar I, I, I ever saw. So you talk about influence. You know, the, She was the first person that showed me that you can be a scholar and not just sit up in uh, some white man's ivory tower away from your people. I saw Dr. Malvo engaging the people. And so, um, you know, we owe, or at least I, I know I do, and, I, and those of you who re respect what I do, you can't respect what I do without respecting what she does. You know, she, she opened that gate for me. Uh, also, uh, her other books are called Surviving and Thriving, 365 Facts on Black Economic History. Also, she wrote Are We Better Off, Race Politics, or excuse me, Race, Obama, and Public Policy. Uh, and by the way, everybody, if you just came in, please hit the thumbs up button, hit the share button, subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, take one second also when you hit the subscribe button because you're on the Black Financial Channel, theblackfinancialchannel.com. Hit that notification bell so you'll be notified whenever we go live. It's very important. Hit the notification bell. Also, a reminder to everybody, the All Black National Convention is in 10 days. So if you are super black every day of the week and twice on Sundays, 
go to allblacknationalconvention.com. We got a lot of people coming through. Dr. Malbo, I'm, I, I want you to come to the next one. I'm gonna invite you. I'm gonna try to get on your schedule because I'd love for you to come to the next one. Uh, and uh, but everybody else who wants to come this year, or uh, go to allblacknationalconvention.com. If you want to watch the recording of the events, we can't promise a live stream. We're still trying to see if we can set that up, but we can get the video for this one as well as all the other conventions and all the other things that we've done, the movies, the, the film, the, the event I did with Farrakhan, you know, things like that. You can go to um, allblackeducation.com. It's allblackeducation.com. And you can sign up and you can view the footage of the event right after it's done. We, we, we have that footage loaded and try to do a live stream. So that's allblackeducation.com. The first month is free. So go give that a try if you'd like to be there, if you can't make it there. All right, so Dr. Malbo, let, let me ask you this question. Okay, so speaking of Obama, and you wrote this book, Are We Better Off? And uh, you got into a lot of trouble because, uh, you know, you, you kind of challenged uh, some of our thinking on, on the Obama presidency. And I want to ask you uh, more about that, definitely in a broader context for sure. But I'd like to start with one thing that's very recent. Um, President Trump made a statement on Twitter in which he was he was trying to make the argument that that, that the Obama should be investigated for this massive deal they made with Netflix, that uh, the Obamas, you know, that, that, that you know, they went, they, they left office and suddenly, you know, they're, they're showered with money. And, uh, you know, and I think it seems to me that the argument is, OK, you were doing all these people favors when you were in office. And now these favors are being returned with financial compensation and opportunity. Uh, he's, all, he's asking for an investigation. Um, do you think that has merit? Uh, and, and what are your what are just your general thoughts about that, about somebody leaving office and then suddenly making just tons of money, white, black, or otherwise? Well, first of all, 45 is the last person to be talking about investigating somebody for deals. We can investigate that Trump hotel down the street where he has foreign dignitaries staying. He we can investigate the fact he wants to have a G7 summit at the Trump uh Mar a Lago. Um, the, you know, I mean. We can inv investigate Ivanka getting those trademarks from China um, for her, her various and sundry merchandise. So he's the last one. Secondly, I didn't. I didn't know, by the way, I didn't know China really. I didn't. So China gives you just trademarks. I, I thought they just stole everybody's intellectual property. I didn't. Well, I they didn't steal property, but, okay. <laughs> but but they also will give you trademarks to do stuff in their country. So okay. she has an exclusive on a couple of things. Uh, I don't. I don't even know the things are. So don't give me the line. But she was lobbying them while her father was having them at Mar a Largo. She's lobbying them, and then next thing you know, she gets these trademarks. Mm -hmm. So they, these people, I mean, they have turned the White House into a grifter's paradise, and um, they really don't have any business saying anything to anybody. But secondly, um, the presidency, having been a president at a relatively young age, you know, the, the Obamas are in their fifties. What are they going to do next? You know, they're going to create opportunities for themselves. I don't think it's a deal of you did favors then and now you're cleaning up with them now. They're hot. I mean, people still love them. So they got to deal with Netflix. They got to deal with a, a book. They got a, a joint book deal that's worth 60 million. Well, I believe Michelle has probably made that 60 million or part of it back to the to the publisher. I don't have a problem with it. I mean, the Clintons made money. Everybody, I think Harry Truman was probably the last one, or maybe Eisenhower, who said they weren't going to profit from the presidency. But unless we give these people sizable pensions, they get a pension, it's not sizable. Unless we give them, they're, they're young, they're vital, they're making money. I ain't mad at them. I, in fact, right on. Give me 1%, y'all. Uh, you know, but, but right on. I, just, I don't have a problem with that. I think that uh, 45 is obsessed with the Obamas. He is utterly obsessed and Melania equally obsessed. She basically samples Michelle whenever she can. Uh, not that she has an original thought in her own mind, but um, no, he's wrong, but but he's wrong. Of, you know, he, the, my mom often says, even a broken clock is right twice a day. That's about how often he's right, twice a day. And this ain't the twice. When you talk about investigating the Obamas, I think it's silly. Mm. Well, you know, what, what's interesting is, you know, it's uh, it, it's 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 hmm. it, it almost seems um, strange. You know, I, I think that when you're talking about first of all, I don't think I don't think we can any of us can be mad at somebody for making money if it's ethical and legal. And I think that's fine. Um, I, I think I wonder if someone other than Trump had made that statement. I mean, you're, you're right. It, it, it sounds like the pot calling the kettle black. 
uh, if, if, if that was a bad thing, or maybe white. We need to change that term anyway. So yes, please, right. let's. Right. Um, but it's it's uh, interesting, right? If, if somebody other than Trump, who has, as you, met, as you mentioned, profited in so many ways, I mean, even even with his, uh, his tweets, the fact that he knows he can move the stock market with his tweets, you, you, it's easy to imagine him using that for his, the advantage of himself or his friends. Um, in fact, Trump is under investigation for um, uh, alerting his friend, I, I, I want to say, was it T. Boone Pickens, uh, warning him that he was about to make an announcement on the tariffs. And right before that, this, this other billionaire sells all of his stock in his uh, China holdings and, 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 and protects himself from a massive $30 million loss. And, you know, they're thinking that Trump actually, you know, gave him the heads up. And also there's allegations from people inside the Trump administration that Trump uh, deliberately uh, exaggerates his tweets about China to move the market. Right. And, and that's something that, you know, I, that I see. And I can't imagine a guy with an ego of his size not, you know, sort of feeling good about this idea that he can actually move the stock market. But but I, but I think, you know, there, there's also this question of, you know, where do you where, where is, is is there a line that's drawn at all anywhere in terms of, um, you know, how much, you know, how how you make your money after you leave office, right? Like if, if I if I, I mean if I want to do a big money grab, then what I do is I go into office, I do a bunch of favors for a bunch of people, and say I refuse to accept any compensation whatsoever for what I'm doing for you right now. But but then when I get done, I call them up and I say, hey, remember I'm the guy that got you that billion dollar deal. What what you gonna do for me, right? Not not in, in so many words, right? And so and if you look at the size of the deals, I mean, I you know the the Michelle Obama book deal, I I, I would imagine she's going to make over 100 million or close to it before she's done. The the Obama Netflix deal that, that both of them got, uh, that's probably you know that's got to be close to 100 million. From what I've been hearing about all these other Netflix deals, are pretty massive. And so I wonder, is, is there any line in terms of you know just how well you do after all after you leave office? I mean, we know that they're all going to make money. They all do. The Bushes, the Clintons, everybody makes money. But is there a line? And if so, should there be one? Or if well, not, there should... probably should be a line around influence peddling. But I don't think that the Obamas or the Clintons or the Bushes, frankly, need to peddle influence. When you have, if you're a commercial capitalistic enterprise and your job is to maximize profits, having an Obama imprimatur on a film, a book or something is going to increase your profits because they're very popular. So they're monetizing their popularity. I wouldn't say that they're monetizing their presidency, that they're monetizing their popularity. Just as, as I said, George uh, W. Bush had a, a book about his paintings or whatever. I mean, who in the Sam Hell thinks that George <laughs> W. Bush is a talented painter? No, he's a former president and that makes it exciting. Um, it would be good if we were able to figure out some lines, but I don't, you know, I mean, even I don't, I didn't care for the Bushes, as you know, but I do respect their integrity as I, I don't respect 45 doesn't have any integrity. I think the Obamas did. I don't think there were influence peddling with the issue of what can we get at the end? I think that they knew they will get some at the end because they're popular enough. Their books are going to sell. They're, they've got this film deal, the film are going to be watched. Their name means something. And hey, props to them for monetizing. My father is one. Mm. Well, you know, I, I think I, I agree with you. I mean, I, they, they have, you know, a powerful brand, right? Like there's no question about it. Um, you know, and fame sells, right? You know, Kim Kardashian, the, the Kardashian family, I think they're raking in a hundred million a year just for and being. And they ain't done nothing. They rank in a hundred million for being hoes and <laughs> Whatever. So I guess Holland pays in some circles. Um, but it, it, I, forgive me, y'all. But I mean, I just I, I can't understand that phenomenon at all. And that's <laughs> but all these things, when you say monetizing fame, it's about us. It's about what we what we go for, what we you know, who believes a hype? You know, you have sex on the air or taped, show your cooch on the air and then people want to buy your stuff. Ooh, that's nasty to me. But I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's uh, that's hilarious. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you know, it's it's a uh, when you when you compare it to something, when you make it relative and you say, OK, Obama's are making their money. But look at Trump or Obama's are making their money. But look at Kim Kardashian. Then, you know, it, it puts it all into perspective. Right. We know the world we live in. And I, I, I guess I just kind of wondered if, if there was any kind of line. And I think, um, you know, it's it's this interference of money, the political 
or excuse me, the economic motivations behind, you know, so much of our political activity, I think that's going to ruin this country. I mean, I think- Well, you know, if you could, if you could draw a straight line to say, let's say, it with uh, T. Boone Pickens and 45, if you could draw a straight line and say, uh, Obama cut this deal, loosen regulation on Netflix in 2014, and therefore he then got this deal with Netflix. If you could draw a straight line, that would be objectionable. But I don't think you can draw that straight line. I think it might be a dotted line. It might not even be a dotted line. It might be zigzag. Um, but we know that the they did a great job at some level. Now, you know, I disagree with some of what they did, but they did a great job uh, objectively. And now they're selling it. Mm. Okay. I ain't mad at nobody. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think I think it's fine. Too. I mean, I, I guess I was curious about it just in terms of, um, you know, whether there's something we're missing on this. But I'd be curious to also ask you about this. Um, I live in Chicago and, uh, you know, and I, and I hear I hear what people you know say about uh, Obama in his presidency, good and bad. And I know you wrote a book, uh, Are We Better Off, Race, Obama and Public Policy. And uh, and I would imagine that you're not a critic of Obama. Um, I don't think you are. I've never seen you as a as a, as a, a, an extreme critic. Like I'm going to go after him, but you have been objective in your analysis, which seemed to cause you a lot of problems. Uh, what would you say that people can say? You know, there was good or bad uh, for Black people in particular about the Obama presidency, because a lot of the perception amongst a lot of Black people here is that you know the neighborhood is still the same. Uh, yeah. you, know, you still have 45 percent black unemployment rate in South Side Chicago, where Obama lived. Um, you know, and and I I would just say if he just tweeted about it a few times, that would that right there might drive people to action. If he even acknowledged it, and and and, uh, and I, it almost seems that Trump has this um, you know part of his Trump card, if you will, to, you know, pun intended, is that he can tweet about the things that Obama never touched, and 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 basically say, look, at least I'm talking about it. At least I'm talking about black people. Your own black president didn't seem to really even want to talk about your issues at all, right? Um, I, I don't and, know that, and that was that was the tragedy of Obama. I mean, the good news about Obama is that he was, but, but no, let's pull it back. Barack Obama never claimed to be a progressive, to be left of center. He was always pretty much a democratic centrist. Um, his views were not very different from Hillary. She probably was to the left of him. She probably would have done more for black people than he did. He was always caught up in, I'm not a black president, I'm the nation's president. I remember uh, I interviewed him in 2004. I was working with Willie Gary's television station at the time at the convention. I was lucky enough to snag him. We know people in common, Charles Ogletree, others. So we're having a very, very lovely conversation until I ask him about reparations. At which point, my man jumps up out the, off the chair and says, turn that camera off. <laughs> he has a total. Oh, background. wait, uh, don't, don't just, don't skip over that story. Are y'all as shocked as I am? So just tell us more. So you talked to President Obama. Well, I was able to get, he was, he was Senator then. Senator, Senator Obama. Obama, okay. Well, he, so I was able to get, um, in fact, he was a state Senator then. He hadn't even run for Senate. Remember, he was a keynote speaker at the 2004 Democratic Convention. One right. of the speakers. So I was working for Willie Gary and um, I was charged with, you know, gathering stories and, you know, wearing my journalist hat. I begged, borrowed and everything else to get him. Everybody, you know, he was a hot ticket. Ogletree helped, a bunch of people called. Rock, you got to talk to Malvo. So um, there we had it. We're in my suite. Um, you never forget it. The uh, core Barry was sitting uh, in the other side of the room, she's like, I'm not getting in your interview, but she did jump in for a couple of pictures. But <laughs> anyway, we, um, I'm we're having a great conversation, really great conversation. His little handler had said, I only have 15 minutes, but we did the, you know how black people are, we do the getting to know you, who we know in common. It turned out we are there for like 30, 40 minutes until I asked about reparations. When I asked about reparations, he totally like went off. Like he jumped off the chair, he said, turn off the, turn off the microphone, we're not recording this. And, you know, he wow. did not even want to be in the same sentence in the same room with reparations. So wow. he's like, nope, to the nope, to the nope. Next thing you know, the little handler is gathering up their stuff. And I'm like, okay, dude, can we at least close the interview out? I can say bye so we can edit this part out and we can say bye and it's civil. 
So we did, and you, know, you, you should never have asked me about that. But see, since he was a student of Ogletree's and Tree was in all of the reparation struggle, I figured he would be down with it, at least have a conversation. He could have said, I don't agree with it, but he didn't want to, he didn't want uh Oh, it looks like Dr. Malvo froze for a second. She should come right back. Dr. Malvo, can you hear me? Are you guys able to hear us? Uh, are we still coming through? Let us know if you can still hear us and you can see us. It looks like we're having some uh, connectivity issues. Can you guys hear us and see us? There's a little bit of a delay. So give us a yes or no if you can hear us and see us. Only me? Okay, Obama must be watching. <laughs> Now tell me, did that freak y'all out? I, I think Dr. Malvo will come back in in a second. But um, tell me, did that did did that remark not fuck you up? I mean that no, I don't mean to cuss. I'm sorry, but that freaked me out. Like I was like, really, I did not know about this interview, and I and I think that that's interesting, right? It kind of shows what happens when you're trying to code switch and live on both sides of the fence, uh, because. Charles Ogletree, I you know I know Ogletree as well, or I've, I've worked with him. We we both spoke at the uh, National Black Law Student Association uh, annual conference, and I met him there, and, and I've known him through the years. And, uh, and 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 so Obama learned from Ogletree, so it's like he's got these you know tiny roots in the black community, but he's also got these other connections elsewhere. And so you know the first of all, the idea that somebody had to convince him to talk to Julianne Malvo is a problem right there, and that's what they tend to do. They tend to think. That because I'm just, you know, I'm this special Negro now, I don't have to respect the elders from the black community, the ones who, uh, you know, who carry weight in the in the black community. But also, you know, I think that he probably did. He was surprised that, that she was actually going to ask him about an issue that was specific to black people. I think that uh, there's kind of a code amongst a lot of the black elite, you know, the bougie Negroes, they, because they, they're so interested in getting a seat at the table. Uh, they don't actually use their opportunity at the table to get anything done. They're sitting there in awe of the fact that they're even there, that they don't actually ask those hard questions. So I think, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that story really resonated with me like that. Like I've heard other stories about Barack, um, you know, but that's probably one of the most compelling uh, examples of, you know, of the problems of his pet presidency that, that I've seen, you know, and, and if you notice, the reparations debate been going on, like it's been happening uh, extensively in the black community. And I want to ask you guys, yes or no, yes or no. Have you heard Michelle or Barack speak, say one word publicly about reparations? Have you heard Michelle or Barack say one word about reparations? Give me a yes or no. If you've, if you've seen them tweet anything, if you've seen them mention anything on Facebook, mention anything on a newscast, if you've seen them, you know, uh, send out a smoke signal, say something on the radio. Like what? What have you seen that Michelle or Barack has ever seen? Has ever said about reparations? They have not said one word about it. And I and I personally think that look, if if you're going to profit from your relationship with the black community, then you know great power comes with a responsibility. If you're going to profit from black people, you must be giving something back. And I think the question becomes, what if, what are they giving back? What 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 are they adding? I'm not telling you to make I, what that decision should be. I think that that's your choice, right? If you're happy with what they're giving you, then that's fine. But if you're not, I think you shouldn't be afraid to say something. I mean, I'd be very curious, you know, like like because I I, I mean I see these movies they're making. They're not making anything that's you know uniquely rooted in the black experience. I, I'm not, you know, I think they made a movie about a, a you know some uh, Ohio workers and so Chinese a, a factory being bought by a Chinese billionaire or something. Like it's like all this other shit, you know, and my thing is like his power was rooted in black people. You know, if black people had never supported the Obama, Obama's never would have got to the White House. And so um, I think Dr. Malvo's back. You back, Dr. Sorry Dr. about that. I don't know what happened. I don't right. Okay. That's all right. We were sitting here just just freaking out over what you just said, that story. Just so you know, you just broke our internet with that one. Because I I, I <laughs> none of us had heard that one. So please continue. So uh, so what, what is your perspective on that incident? So you, you sat down with Barack and you had a great conversation and you brought up reparations and suddenly he, that was like, that was the thing that immediately triggered him. And he totally freaked out. 
he yeah. totally freaked out. Um, but I think that that's a metaphor for his presidency. He he's a, was a decent democratic centrist president. He was not. Oh, it looks like the audio and the video went out. You know, I'm gonna tell you, this makes you think COINTELPRO is real. It, every, we just got to the best part of the conversation and, and uh, the, the internet keeps going out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just link back up with Dr. Malvo uh, and maybe we can get a stronger Wi-Fi for next time. And uh, Dr. J, if you can hear me, I'm gonna call you and we're gonna set this up again so we can finish uh, this discussion. Um, and, uh, and I want you guys to feel free, please share this, you know, share this interview. I'm not here. We're not here to bash anybody. Right. You know, but you can't call some, you can't call people haters just because they're bringing out the truth. Right. So ultimately, um, I think that that's quite fascinating. And I think the question that I would ask Michelle and Barack is straight up point blank period. What is your position on reparations? And don't give us any bullshit because here's the thing. The black community is much smarter than we politically than we were even 10 years ago. And uh, the things that we would have fallen for in 2008 are not things that people will fall for in 2019. That is what you call progress. That is what you call progress within a community. Um, and I think that that's a beautiful thing, you know. So, uh, you know, the other day I, I mentioned that in the debate with, between T.I. and Killer Mike and all those guys, I, you know, T.I. said that the black community has progressed, you know, in this generation. And I was saying that I would beg to differ with him because if, if you look at most measuring sticks of progress, we haven't, you know, made a lot of progress. But one area where progress is being made is is in our political savvy, our, our political and economic intelligence. And that did not come from your oppressor. That did not come from the Democrats. That did not come from white folks. That did not come from public schools. That did not come from white universities. That did not come from the media. That came from right here. That came from spaces like this, where Black people are having authentic, intelligent conversations and figuring out the reality of the world on our own independently and having our own conversations. Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen on that? Give me an amen so, so I know that we're at least on the same page on this. I believe that the importance of Black media is because we have spaces now where we can have honest conversations amongst ourselves and really ask our, and question everything. You must question everything you've been taught at least in the last 50, 60 years, maybe even before then, okay? So, uh, you know, just basic things like, why is it that our children know more about George Washington than they know about Marcus Garvey? Who the fuck made that rule up? Who decided that black children should know more about a slave master than they know about a liberator of slaves and a liberator of human beings? The great Marcus Garvey. How in the hell did your babies get through eight to 12 years of school and four years of college, probably with the Yale or Brown and know nothing about Marcus Garvey? That is sick. That is a reflection of our mental illness. I'm talking about me and you, Danny, Valerie, Adonis, Motown House, Kathy Fisher, everybody watching. Like, we need to check ourselves and really kind of just look back and say, wait a minute, this don't even make no damn sense. You know, and then when you figure that out, then you can start saying, okay, let's reconstruct a reality that makes sense to based on what, you know, who we are, what we need to do, and where we want to go, right? So that, that's that's it. That's that's my point. I think I'm glad that story got out. I, I'm happy to have provided the platform to let Dr. Malvo share that story. And in case you're wondering, I'm about, and like, like my cousin say, I'm about ready finna go tell everybody. I'm, I'm finna go tell everybody. I don't even say finna that much, but right now I'm about ready finna go tell everybody about what Dr. Melvo just said. Just watch me. Watch, watch, watch me work this out because we're going to get this out there. So I'm about to go, guys. Thank you for hanging out. Um, I'll get Dr. Melvo back on soon. I'm going to text her right now, find out if we can get a better Wi-Fi for next time. Uh, hit the thumbs up button, share, and subscribe. Make sure, uh, definitely hit that thumbs up button if you're on the Black Financial channel, if you're on YouTube. Hit the notification bell also and subscribe button because if you're subscribed to Dr. Boyce TV, uh, that's different from the Black Financial Channel. The Black Financial Channel is purely financial. I, we hit economic topics on this all day, every day. Uh, stock market updates, what's going on with the economy, stuff like that, personal financial conversations. That's theblackfinancialchannel.com, T H E, theblackfinancialchannel.com. Also, don't forget, all Black National Convention happens in 10 days, Houston, Texas. We got a long roster of great people that are going to be there. Uh, make sure you show up if you can. If you can't show up, that's okay too. But uh, we'd love to have you there. And just to give you some names of some people that are going to be there, uh, we're going to have uh, Nicole Price, who's a leadership expert, Dr. George C. Frazier, uh, Willie D. from the Ghetto Boys. Uh, we've got, um, let's see here, Sharif Abdul-Malik from We Buy Black, uh, Col the founder of We Buy Black. 
uh, D1, who's a hip-hop artist, who's very, very good, who actually, I think he signed a big contract with somebody. I don't know. He's doing some big things. Uh, Daniel Pierce, who's a real estate expert. The Royal Mix, which is the hottest female group in the country right now, as far as I'm concerned. Best group since TLC. Dr. LaChanja Watkins, my sister, but also uh, Vicki Dillard from Fly Nubian Queen. Uh, we've got uh, this brother here, Dr. Rick Wallace. Uh, Michael Amotep from the African History Network. Uh, Julian Gordon, who's uh, an entrepreneurship expert, Noma Langabu, Shally Moses, and Dr. Ron Daniels, among others. So there's a whole lot of people that are going to be there. So uh, if you want to learn more, go to allblacknationalconvention.com. That's allblacknationalconvention.com. If you want to watch uh, watch it on video, we're going to try to have a live stream, but if we can't, the recordings will be loaded immediately. Uh, go sign up at allblacketucation.com. That's allblacketucation.com. That's our um, that's also called ABNC Digital, but that's the place where you can go to watch uh, recordings of every single convention we've had. They're all really good, excellent speakers, excellent discussions. We've also got films in there like uh, Democracy, A Black American Horror Story, uh, The Black Love Blueprint that you can watch for free. Uh, what is it? Um, a really good film called The Melanin Code. The Melanin Code is right up there with Hidden Colors in terms of really great films in the, the, made by black filmmakers. Um, so it's kind of like a, a Netflix for smart black people, basically, except better than Netflix because it's education. So we have the event that I did with Louis Farrakhan, all three hours of that footage, you can watch that. Uh, we have the, the event I did with Dr. Cornell West. So there's just a ton of stuff in there, lectures and information that you can watch with your whole family. So feel free to go to allblackeducation.com and the first month is totally free. So that's the best part too. The first month is free, allblackeducation.com. And you can also, if you want to, talk to our, um, our, our experts at the Black Business School who will be right there on the line who can chat with you about your economic future, help you come up with your personal wealth plan and all that good stuff. So we got plenty of resources for you. Uh, our goal is to build a nation and we want to give you every tool that you want to build your family and to do what you want to do in-house without depending on external systems to get things done. So we're building systems. That, that's what we're doing. That's the master plan. That's the agenda, right? Everybody else got an agenda. We have an agenda too. We have a black agenda and that's, we don't apologize for that. So take care guys. Have a good day. Thanks for hanging out with me and um, uh, keep it real. See you soon. Bye-bye.